guys, it's the great Elgin Baylor. I'd be remiss if I didn't show you his card. No, uh, I'm not being out of sync. I'm going to make a connection from last week's show that uh, really paid tribute to the great Laker Hall of Famer, general manager, and coach in the NBA, the great Elgin Baylor. Why? Because he had as unbelievable career in the NCAA uh, as he did at the pro level. And that's where we're taking this because I, I do want to talk a little bit about the NCAA March Madness tournament and the history of it, especially now that Gonzaga winning like they did uh, in overtime on a last second three point field goal from basically mid court to seal the deal against the UCLA Bruins. And they couldn't have uh, defeated a, a tougher uh, rival, a, a tougher opponent, uh, very competitive. They'll be back, the Bruins, but also kind of uh, a team that symbolically is important on maybe Gonzaga's March Madness run to an undefeated season and a title, and that is that UCLA will have in common with Gonzaga if they can pull it off tomorrow night. Uh, a championship season that was also undefeated. And I'd like to take a look at the uh, number of teams, not too many, that went into the tournament unbeaten and came out unscathed as a national title and, of course, unbeaten as well. And that's where my cartoon leads us for this week. It's not really out of sync, but I think you'll understand where I'm coming from. Uh, guy just ripped up his brackets. Earl Roberts, Ohio, Abilene Christian, Loyola, Chicago, North Texas State. Think of it as their Hoosers moment. And of course, the Hoosers moment. Yes, I'm actually wearing a hoodie that my wife got me. I'm not a big Indiana fan, mind you. And in fact, the Hoosers moment is this. If you've not never seen the movie, you'll know that a very small town in Indiana, a farm town, goes on, uh, goes through their version in the Hoosier State of winning their March Madness tournament. Uh, a little team comprised of just eight players, and I wouldn't even consider them all eight as players because, one, the runt of the litter, uh, little Ollie, is really more a team manager, although he contributes to a champion, uh, you know, to a winning, uh, winning points uh, on their way to the ch in the championship run. But that Hoosers team, that Hoosers moment, it's all about the small schools getting their chance to go on and beat the big Goliaths acting like David and defeating the Goliaths in the NCAA tournament. And that's what the movie Hoosers, which is actually based on a true story uh, of Milan, uh, Indiana from 51, 52. That was uh, their dream season where they went on and defeated all the big boys to win the Indiana state tournament. And much like that, Gonzaga has come really out of nowhere from the WCC, which sounds more like a, a wrestling conference with uh, Vince McMahon as the proprietor than it does a basketball conference or even an athletic conference. But that's a, a, a league that's actually – and here's uh, – it, it's, it's amazing how uh, sports circles back. And uh, it's a league that is comprised of teams from Northern California, from Oregon – and uh, Washington State, of course, Gonzaga from Spokane or Spokane, whichever way you want to pronounce it. But in that league is the San Francisco Dons, who had some great moments in the late 50s, uh, are starting to try to get back some semblance. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, they had a very competitive team. And St. Mary's, also up in, in the Bay Area, uh, also in that league. And, of course, they've had some very good uh, NCAA tournament uh, participants from their school. But Gonzaga is still a little, uh, the little school from the little conference taking on all the big boys. And I've said, I've actually said it here. Uh, I'm wondering if one day Gonzaga and BYU, and I brought this up on other Park Ridge uh, episodes, whether they would one day join the big East as these leagues just continue 
to change their appearance, change their looks, and expand not just the members, but the logistics as well, going almost from coast to coast. They would be the Big East. <laughs> that would be funny that uh, Seton Hall would be playing in Gonzaga and that you would look and see, all right, Big East. Okay, the game is going to start at Pacific Coast time. Uh, but it just goes to show you the insanity of all these conferences as they all fight for that piece of gold at the uh, end of the rainbow. And for Gonzaga, this is, uh, le well, let's just start here. Uh, Gonzaga has been a player, I would say for the last 20 years, if uh, they're, they're not coming out of nowhere. And that's really the point of my research this week on the teams that won undefeated and who they beat and the conferences they were, that they were a member. Uh, most of them, like you, uh, North Carolina and UCLA and, of course, Indiana, are from what we today call the power schools or the power conference schools. Uh, power conference schools. Uh, you're talking about the Pac-10, you know, the Big 12, the Big 10, the Big East, the ACC, the Southeast Conference. They're seen as the uh, big power schools. And I don't know if I really consider the Big East only because they don't play football. The other schools do. Uh, but that being said, one thing that I saw that you could say was very prevalent in all these teams that go undefeated is that they just didn't come out of nowhere and say one year they went 14 and 14, then 13 and 14, then 25 and 0 and they get to the tournament. With maybe one exception that I can think of, and that was Larry Bird's Indiana State Sycamores of 78-79 who entered that uh, March Madness undefeated. I believe they were 26-0 and 0 under Bill Hodges. And Larry uh, Bird led that team. I think the previous year, they were in the NIT. And I think they were like 18-8. and eight. And then the uh, – so to me, they kind of came out of nowhere. I know that Bird graced the cover that season – it's a famous cover with the two cheerleaders uh, bookending uh, Larry Bird. And it's kind of cool because he is dressed in like typical garb of high school basketball or what we perceive as college basketball from the 60s and 50s. Very short shorts, kind of a, an elaborate, kind of a, a glossy look to his uniform, kind of like what Hoosers in the in the movie. Uh, they're very glossy looking, the uniforms, and very short shorts, not like the bag. I prefer the baggy ones today, but also the very high socks. You know, the only, only school, and this is what kind of made it uh, generational for me, but if you take a look at the old Pete Maravich pictures, you remember those real thick, woolly athletic socks that had about three stripes, one very wide and two very small. And you wouldn't raise them all the way up. You made them into sloppy socks. Well, we went from sloppy socks to, remember what the NBA used to wear. They actually had stirrup uh, socks underneath the white hosiery, similar to you know, uh, the football players and just the opposite of what baseball players wore in the 60s. Now, the players, I don't even think some of them wear socks. They just wear uh, the socks that fit you know, inside the sneaker, you know, right around their ankle. But it used to be, <laughs> take a look at the 70s, stuff, the real high socks, the tube socks, and they had striping and all the rest of it. And then it got, uh, Maravich brought in the sloppy socks. Then they went back to the high hosiery. And now you, uh, many of the players are wearing black socks. And the funny thing is the black socks were big with the uh, Fab Five, and when we wore those on a basketball court, when we played sandlot basketball, if we wore black socks with our sneakers, everybody made fun of us because you're supposed to wear white socks with sneakers. And those kids made it acceptable to wear the black socks. Now, I don't play without black socks. It's amazing how fashion changes that way. And for all things fashion, that's probably the only thing that I am up on or uh, up this uh, – the current uh, fashion, and as with things athletic. Anyway, let's just start. And here's how life 
and, and, and basketball is so circular and, and all things just seem to come around uh, what goes around. That undefeated San Francisco team of the, the Dons was, of course, headed by Bill Russell and Casey Jones, future teammates on the Boston Celtics. And, of course, how ironic is this? Casey Jones would become a coach and lead the Celtics to glory. And he would play under, I believe, uh, Bill Russell, at least in his last year in the NBA, Casey Jones. And, of course, they were they were coached in, uh, in San Francisco by a fellow by the name of Phil Wolpert, who succeeds uh, Pete Newell, who attains glory at the University of California. But Newell is seen as the be-all and end-all, uh, the coach's coach, uh, when you want to learn the inside uh philosophy of basketball, all, all the coaching innards, uh, you would go to uh, Pete Newell. But that team that does go undefeated, here's the irony of it all. They win the previous season. Same players, same core, same coach. They lost one game, though, the, the previous year, and it was the second game of the season. And, of course, I'm using basketball uh, reference as my source. And who do they lose to? The UCLA Bruins. It's amazing. And this is what I'm saying. It's amazing how there are uh, in sports, how uh, let's say there are certain elements of each individual sports. Uh, you know, let's say the Yankees and the Red Sox. And of course, what they have in common, the fact that Babe Ruth played for both and that it was because Ruth going to from the Yankee uh, from the Red Sox to the Yankees that all of a sudden one team ascended and the other team couldn't sniff another World Series title for over 100 years. It's amazing. And then, of course, Ruth uh, goes back to Boston and plays his final year with the Braves in the National League. Well, here again, UCLA, who is seen as the dominant team, probably uh, would be on the Mount Rushmore of, you know, if you were inviting the four greatest schools in terms of dynasties to basketball, what four would you invite to the Final Four? Would it be UCLA, Kentucky, North Carolina, and Kansas? Would it be UCLA, North Carolina, Indiana, and Kentucky? Would you include Duke in that discussion? Uh, would you include, uh, I'm just trying to think of a team from the East that won, uh, I don't know, let's, let's just say St. John's, which won a number of NITs. I don't think so. But I'm just I'm just saying. So there's about six really good teams or dynasties in basketball that you could say, boom, could how are you going to get those six into four? But really, in every discussion, you'd have to consider UCLA simply because 10, uh, 10 titles in 12 years. Incredible. And here they are defeating San Francisco, another real dynasty. And I don't consider it a mini dynasty because they win back-to-back -back titles. Not too many teams can, can lay claim to that with probably the greatest winner in basketball history, Bill Russell. And I have done that discussion too. Who's the greater winner? I always think it's Yogi Berra because of his uh, assistant, uh, being, an, uh, being an assistant coach. Uh, you know, he does win a couple of titles, but never the big one, World Series. He does win a couple of pennants. But I think I did a whole study on it. I think Yogi Barra comes out on top by like half a point. <laughs> but i got to be honest with you. I would take either one's career, Yogi Barra's baseball or Bill Russell's basketball career. Actually, though, uh, you would have to consider Russell's more global because he has the Olympics and he's got the college in addition to the pros. Yogi is really just a parochial, just focused on Major League Baseball. Anyway, uh, that Russell team dominated. They really they lost to UCLA the second game of the season in 1954-55. So they really won, ready for this, 54 games in a row over those two seasons, including the national title. Interestingly enough, I always thought it was about three or four games. Then I was doing the research. Here's what San Francisco had to do. They had to defeat West Texas State, Utah, Oregon State, which was not – there was no formal Pac-8, which would become the Pac-10 that we know as today. Uh, Oregon State was what they called, I think, in the PCAA, and I don't even think it was that. 
I think they were, and I'm not even going to say they were independent, but they were in a very small uh, conference. I actually think uh, Idaho and Idaho State were also in that. I'll have to investigate. I just didn't have time to look that up. Colorado, they had to defeat, I believe, in the uh, in the semis in the Final Four. And then they defeat, I believe, Tom Gola and the LaSalle Explorers. You know, LaSalle is a member of that uh, Big Five in Philadelphia. It's a loosely constructed conference, but they always played each other, always at the uh, Palestra in Philadelphia, which is the home court for uh, the Penn Quakers. So you had Penn, LaSalle, uh, Temple, Villanova, and St. Joe's all competing in that little mini Big Five. And they had some great contests. They had some great players in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, even today. It's not as, as big today only because every one of them is tied into a conference. And really what they're trying to do is you're not picking on each conference, but Villanova really does want to play the Sal if they can get a game against a, a bigger power conference because it's all about getting – the points and the rankings for playing the, uh, the power conferences. Anyway, that team, the San Francisco Dons, KC Jones averaged nine points a game, and Russell, ready for this, 20 points, 21 rebounds. Now, you can say, well, nobody could shoot the ball then, but have you seen shooting percentages today? And I think it's uh, – you, you, you could – you could probably say it's because Russell so dominated the game and there wasn't big men then and the players today are so much more athletic and they're so much bigger that rebounds in the 20s today, it, you'll never see it again. But still, I think that's taking away from Russell. 20 points, 20 rebounds a game. You know, we've fallen over the players with the triple doubles. How about the guys with the double-double 20s? That's incredible. That's dominant. And I would love to see how many of those, uh, and of course the record books don't have this, but how many of those 20 rebounds that Russell got were putbacks, you know, offensive rebounds that kept, let's say, an offensive series going on one end of the court. The Next we go to the 56-57 UNC Tar Heels. And it was Frank McGuire, Al's older brother. Both guys win national titles. I don't believe Frank McGuire won an NIT. I know this. Al McGuire wins an NIT in 1970 with his son, Ali McGuire, playing, and they beat St. John's. And interestingly enough, that Marquette squad, some of those guys played on the 67 NIT runner-up, and they lost to Walt Frazier and the Southern Illinois uh, Salute guy in that one. So uh, here we go again. We're in a bar. These are things I'm always um, that are just coming off the top of my head as we're downing a beer and having a hamburger together. Uh, McGuire, though, goes on to win the title in 77 after beating uh, or losing in the 74 title in March Madness to the NC State uh, Wolfpack. And of course, that NC State Wolfpack, they were helped by McGuire getting a T uh, in the second half and it kind of changed the momentum. But the interesting thing, and this is where history comes back, you know, sir, uh, sports history comes back. McGuire defeats in 77, his last game he ever coached. He goes out in fitting uh, style on top, winning March Madness. He defeated UNC and Dean Smith in uh, the 77 finals. And I'm trying to think where they were. I think they might have been. Well, Charlotte makes it. Uh, UNCC Charlotte with Cedric Maxwell and uh, UNLV with Jerry Tarkanian. I think that's the Rebels' first appearance in the Final Four. How wild is that one? Three hyphens or, or two hyphens, and you can actually make a third hyphen because UNC is UNC Chapel Hill. So that's three. That might be a first in NCAA history where there are three teams that kind of like had hyphens. Uh, in their college name, Nevada, Las Vegas, uh, University of North Carolina, Charlotte, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and of course the Jesuit school, Marquette. Kind of a, a unique Final Four. But the UNC team of 56-57, they defeated Kansas in Triple O, I do believe. 
And uh, they had on that team, led by Frank McGuire, their uh, college coach, Lenny Rosenblum, Pete Brennan, Tommy Kern, and Joe Quigg. And I believe, <clears throat> I know Rosenblum was from New York. And I believe Brennan was as well. But McGuire, they used to call it like an underground railroad or subway from the Northeast to play in the ACC. McGuire made that big. In fact, he goes to South Carolina and does the same thing. This is why the Big East is such a big deal if you're a big college basketball fan because for years all these southern schools were raiding the Northeast and getting our players to go down there and make them into powers. Meanwhile, we were just uh, left with the crumbs, so to speak, and had to fight for the scraps on the table. So the Big East has really kept a lot of these kids home and uh, put the Northeast in prominence once again. In fact, that's what John Thompson had uh, alluded to when he won the championship with Georgetown when they defeated Houston. He said it's nice to have a team from the Northeast win the title for the first time in about 40 years. That it was finally a team, let's say, north of the Mason-Dixon line that finally won a title. And that's what uh, Big John Thompson was alluding to. But that team, 56-57, they finished 32-0. and It's amazing the numbers that are coming back into play. Then 63-64 UCLA, and this starts really the dominance of the Bruins in the NCAA tournament. That team finished 30-0. and uh, They beat on their way to the title. Seattle University, San Francisco. Again, they get revenge on the Dons, or they are maybe a thorn in the San Francisco basketball program. They beat Kansas State, the Wildcats, and they beat the Duke Blue Devils, and they blew them out 98-83. I actually put an asterisk next to this because I said uh, it's interesting that uh, they scored 98 points. And there, you have to remember, in context, 98 points, that's a ton of points today. I mean, it took an overtime, 45 minutes, for uh, both teams to score 90 points in last night's game, UC, uh, UCLA and Gonzaga. 98 points. You had no 30-second clock. You had no three-pointer. And teams, as a rule, well, and Duke was coming from a conference that was starting to be obviously dominated, monopolized by uh, North Carolina and Dean Smith. And he perfected that four corners, which is really, you take the air out of the ball, it's, it, it sucks uh, the clock uh, or drains the clock uh, of time. So if you're up maybe, and this was when he went and stole it, Dean would be up four or five points. It's a tenuous lead. And just play four corners. We do see it still on the high school level around uh, North Jersey, at least in the Bergen County that I've seen it where, where they employ the uh, four corners and it's simply to hold on to a lead. Uh, it actually uh, energizes your, your players because uh, kind of gives them the breath, especially if they've been going up and down the court, especially if they, they, they got it. And with a two, two or three point lead. It does drain the clock, uh, gives your kids confidence when they play it right. It, it, it's an amazing tool that was really perfected by UNC. And that's why they were so tough uh, to play. But the other thing too is this, Duke and 98-83, they get beat. UCLA then doesn't win. Uh, well, they win in 65. Don't win in 66. They are actually only 18 and 8 in 66. And, of course, that's the great UTEP, which was known then as Texas Western. Uh, they uh, defeated Kentucky in the finals, and they were the first school to have, uh, first team to have all five of its starters, uh, African Americans, play and win the national title. I know that Loyola of Chicago had done, I think it was they had four African-Americans play on their 63 title. They started. But this was the first one to have all five players who started were black. Uh, kind of uh, interesting how we've come. And, of course, they've defeated uh, a buzzsaw team, Kentucky, legendary in college basketball and all the rest of it. They come back, though, UCLA, and, boy, do they come back. 67, 68, 69, 70, 71, 72. 73, stop, catch our breath with North Carolina State. 
and 75. They win all these <laughs> March Madness games. Uh, now, they weren't all undefeated. In fact, uh, Jabbar, uh, or 66-67, uh, they go 30-0. and 0. On that team, you have Jabbar, Lucius Allen, who plays in the pros. I think he played with Milwaukee and the Celtics. And you had a guy named Mike Warren, who I think may have gotten a cup of coffee in the NBA. But but many people remember him as being an officer uh, on a hit show, Hill Street Blues. And uh, it was set, I believe, in Pittsburgh or, you know, fic Traditional town, very similar to the town of Pittsburgh. I used to watch it. I, I wasn't an ardent fan of it, but I remember my, Mike Warren was in that. I was like, wow, that guy went from the NCAA, and now he's an actor. And interestingly enough, Ed Marinaro, also a big time, should have been the Heisman Trophy winner in 1971. I just want you to know that. Not Pat Sullivan. That was the biggest crime of the century in, in terms of the Heisman Trophy. Uh, but Ed Marinau goes from a career with the Minnesota Vikings and he turns to acting as well. Both of those guys. That's an interesting question too. Uh, how many, how many top rated shows had a uh, Heisman trophy runner up and a national championship in basketball? But anyway, I digress as always. And so Mike Warren, the only loss they had after that. Well, I, I shouldn't say that. So that was the last undefeated team for UCLA until the 71-72 team. I didn't realize this. I knew they lost to Houston but won the national title. They got beat when Jabbar apparently had scratched the cornea of his eye in a preceding game, came to that one, He, he and he states, he's not using it as an excuse, but he said he can only see out of one eye. And they were playing in the Astrodome. And I know this, this was one of the first times or the first time that Basketball was played in a dome, a cavernous place. And they'll tell you all the time, getting used to playing in these domes, uh, the shooting of the players is kind of off because of the background. It distracts them. Anyway, Jabbar played in the game, still had a fantastic game. They come up short against the Cougars. I think the Cougars uh, were kind of, you know, beating their chests, and UCLA knew they could beat them in a rematch. And boy, did they, because they faced them, and I believe, in the fi semifinals. And uh, they defeat them, blow them out. And um, they beat UNC in the title game. So they beat in 68. They had to beat New Mexico State, who they would face a number of times in the opening rounds. And I shouldn't really say opening rounds, because those UCLA teams, they were treated to a first-round opening uh, bye. And then there we go. Because when I was growing up, it was like 25 teams got into the NCAA tournament. That's why so many teams like Bobby Knight will tell you that they turned down the NCAA because they had a better shot, they felt, of winning the NIT, which was just as, well, was seen as prestigious at the time. But it was losing as the NCAA started to expand. And that was one of the reasons why the NCAA expanded was to kind of dominate the basketball scene. And it's taken out the NIT as kind of like a runner-up tournament. It's still valuable. It's still fun to watch, but it doesn't have the same importance as it did when I was growing up. Winning the NIT in the 60s and 70s was as big still then as winning the NCAA. And one of the reasons was that teams or uh, teams that were invited to the tournament were only the regular season conference champions with the exception of maybe the ACC, which played a tournament at the end. So you were only taking one team. And that's kind of what leads me into my next segue, is that USC had some good teams in the late 60s. Paul Westfall, I recall, as being one of the big guys on that team. And they actually beat UCLA during the regular season. But they didn't qualify for the tournament because I think UCLA – a, they trailed them by one game. I think USC lost a couple other games, and, of course, that was the only game that UCLA lost that year. So uh, they couldn't get into the tournament. So that USC team wasn't even ranked. And I'm, not, and I'm pretty sure uh, that that USC team – I remember this. Ready? Here I go off on another – I remember uh, in, the late, in the early 70s. Now, college basketball was maybe once a week – 
and it was done by TVS on Channel 4, which was this syndicated network, and they sold the rights to uh, NBC, and you had Billy Packer and Dick Enberg doing the games. Uh, and, it, and they would jet in, let's say, uh, Kirk Gowdy to do the March Madness. But you only got to see like one game a week. And uh, I just remember this. Channel 5, which was Metro Media, broadcast uh, UCLA, USC at 1130 at night on a Saturday night. And they did this for a couple of years. And I remember just begging my father to let me stay up and watch the game. And, of course, I kind of took a nap. I was excited all day to watch the game. turned out to be a blowout. And I think we all fell asleep because I was watching with my two brothers, Eddie and Jim. We all fell asleep in the second half. I just remember going to bed and thinking, wow, it's so cool. 1.30 in the morning, I'm going to bed after watching the game. But anyway, UCLA was beaten by USC. That was their only loss that year. And that was 69. Again, they would open against New Mexico State. Then they beat Santa Clara. Drake, of course, Drake had a pretty good year this year. And they beat Purdue and Rick Mount who was seen as the Larry Bird of maybe the 60s, never panned out in the NBA. And then, of course, 71-72, they lost to Notre Dame, which was ranked number nine. Now, I remember the year that Walton lost. They were unbeaten and lost to Notre Dame in South Bend. And this was the 73-74 season. Notre Dame was coming off a national title in football, beating Alabama in the uh, – uh, the Sugar Bowl, 24-23. And then everyone was hyping this because, wow, Notre Dame had the number one team in basketball. It would be a first. And of course, Florida was the first team to win both titles in football and basketball in the same season uh, later on. But this was a first. Well, <laughs> UCLA knew they were better than Notre Dame. <laughs> and uh, I think two weeks later, they met in UCLA and Westwood, and they just got pummeled, the Irish. But that uh, – the funny thing is, if you ever see a YouTube version of that game, you can go back to it. Now, this is the Notre Dame upset, 73-74. Guys on that team were from Jersey, John Shoemate, Gary Brokaw. They had a guy named Pete Crotty. I don't think he was from Jersey, but I just remember him uh, standing out. And of course, these are the first years of uh, Deer Phelps after his success at Fordham. So he comes over seventy after the 70-71 season at Fordham and then really makes the Irish into a national power in his years there. For about 10 years, the Irish were a national power. Uh, got one Final Four with Kelly Trapuca, also of Jersey. And they had other guys, uh, the Paternos from CBA down, down the shore. All these guys he got from David Rivers from St. Anthony. All these guys he got from New Jersey. Anyway, if you take a look at that 73-74 season with uh, Notre Dame and UCLA, Things today, and this is why I don't believe Wooden would have the success today. First of all, he becomes the UCLA coach in 48, and he doesn't have success for another 15 years. Well, today, uh, coaches would be fired or would have been given their walking papers. Uh, today, you're given maybe a, a window of about four years tops to turn a program around. If not, that school moves on and starts rebuilding again with a whole new cast of coaches, and especially at the head coach and maybe the AD as well. And if you do have success at a uh, mid-range or a mid-power, uh, mid-conference power, you move on. Take a look at the Loyola coach who's had success there for the last three, four years and now just named the uh, Oklahoma coach. Anyway, if you take a look, though, Wooden plays the same way from uh, tip-off in the first half to the final seconds in the second half, and that is this. He doesn't take the air out of the ball. He doesn't slow down. Uh, his kids take shots, and it allows Notre Dame to get back in the game and basically beat them by a point. Albeit UCLA does have uh, the last second. It does bounce off the rim. But if you take a look at that game today in context of the strategies of today, you, you'd be saying, what is going on with John Wooden? Why isn't he calling a timeout? Why isn't he doing this? Why isn't he just taking the air out of the ball, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But that's where you have to see these games in context. And I believe that Wooden, to his credit, was saying, I'm going to beat you with how we play from tip-off to the end. 
And if I press you in the beginning, I'm going to press you in the end. And if we have a run and gun uh, offense in the beginning, we're going to do the same thing, even with a six point lead and a minute to go in the game today, that would be unheard of. All right. So anyway, Walton, Wooden, Westwood get their revenge against the Irish later on. And of course they do win the championship in 70. Uh, well, they don't win it in 74 and 73. They win it with uh, Bill Walton having that fantastic night against Memphis. But in 72, 73, Walton and his gang are 30 and 0. Interestingly enough, like Casey Jones and Bill Russell from the San Francisco Dons, Walton and Jamal Wilkes are teammates. They both win two championships in the colleges, and they both win two championships, at least two championships in the NBA. So that's four. And then the fifth is Jabbar winning two and two, at least. And the interesting, I, I saw it as a trivia question that there's only like five or six guys who have ever won two titles in the NCAA, March Madness, and then two titles in the NBA. Now, this may never be seen again, simply because if you win that title and you're uh, the superstar on that team, you're going to the pros. You're not hanging around for that repeat. So it's very rare. Ewing was the exception, but of course he doesn't win the NBA title. Um, and there are other exceptions, but you know what I mean, that you're, the money is just too great to pass up an offer. And then um, Walton in 72-73, they're 30-0. and 0. On that team is a teammate uh, by the name of Larry Farmer, who does, like Walt Hazard, go on and coach the UCLA Bruins. Uh, has some success. It's so tough, though. And probably uh, with, like, Mickey Cronin this year, had no attachment to the UCLA program. And, yes, they haven't won since 96 when Jim Harrick won it. But if you notice, Harrick wins it, really has no – uh, connection to UCLA. So maybe that takes, there's less pressure on those particular coaches to win. But Farmer, he's part of the whole legacy of UCLA, as is Walt Hazard. Uh, and probably, even though they had winning seasons, they don't have the seasons or the magical touch that a Wooden does, or even this guy Cronin does right now, because he's, he's slowly building up the power there in uh, the Bruins. Then 75-76, Indiana, 32-0. and 0. Well, first of all, uh, Walton <clears throat> graduates. And people don't realize this. Between Walton and uh, Jabbar, a.k.a. Lou Alcindor in the college, you had a guy at playing center in 1971 by the name of Steve Patterson. Uh, and Steve Patterson was, let's say, the the bridge between Walton and Jabbar. And they still, this is what makes UCLA so incredible. They still win the title. They beat Nova in the finals that year. <clears throat> in 72, they beat Florida State. Those are basically the two teams that came closest to defeating UCLA in the championship. I have seen bits of the Villanova UCLA game on YouTube. All they show, I couldn't take it anymore. All they showed was all the misses both teams took, and you miss the baskets. It's incredible. Nobody took the baskets. It's like, okay, we know they scored because they're inbounding the ball, but every missed shot is seen on this YouTube. I, I couldn't I couldn't stay uh, or stay on uh, the site any longer. It was just driving me crazy because, as I recall, that 70-71 season with Villanova, they had an unbelievable semifinals. It was played in the Astrodome, I believe. Played on a plat. The court was like a platform, and they had netting, and the players and the coaches were underneath or uh, situated on benches that you had to that you had to step up onto the court and obviously step down from the court down. And I remember guys sliding off and being caught or going into the netting. And I remember the. That's when they actually played the semis on a Thursday night, and the uh, they had a matinee. Uh, the championship game was uh, a matinee, an afternoon game on Saturday. And I do remember watching Western Kentucky with Jimmy McDaniels going against Howard Porter in 1971. The game was a classic. It goes into overtime. Uh, Villanova outlasts Western Kentucky. 
Why I bring those two players up is that if you take a look at the Final Four, those two spots in the NCAA Final Four for 1971 have an asterisk because both those players had signed a deal with an agent and they were going to go uh, to the NBA or the ABA uh, right after basically those games were played. And the NCAA found out, got a sniff of it, and actually ruled and put both schools on probation and have asterisks where there should be their school names in the Final Four. Pretty bizarre. But anyway, Walton and crew come back in 72-73. Walton has the unbelievable game against uh, Memphis and uh, Larry Keenan. And uh, I think he hit 21 of 22 shots. He was just phenomenal. And actually, that was more of a game than I ever thought. Uh, It was very late, maybe the last six, seven minutes of the game where just UCLA just blows them out. But actually, it was back and forth there for a while. And in fact, John Wooden had to take a couple of timeouts, which was not his purview, uh, to kind of settle down the Bruins, even with Walton having this magnificent uh, once-in-a-lifetime, once-in-a-career game. But he was saddled with a number of fouls, and he had to rest, wouldn't have to rest him. It was just remarkable. Now you just start to say, if, probably would have had 55 had he not had foul trouble in that game. But they do beat Memphis. It was in St. Louis. I've watched the video of it again. I couldn't believe that Memphis State was really in that game for more than I ever thought and that it was definitely a partisan Memphis State crowd. So I was always happy about that. Uh, growing up, there were so many UCLA fans uh, in my class or, or guys who seemed to like UCLA, and I was rooting for the young. I could never stand, never liked UCLA, <laughs> and, and they always got me back by winning every tournament that they were uh, involved. Uh, and really, uh, we, we lead up to 75-76, the Indiana team, and this is the one I remember the most. Uh, they had Scott May, Tom Abernathy, Quinn Buckner, and Bobby Wilkerson, who jumped center. And they go on and defeat the Michigan Wolverines, 86-68, just scoring a plethora of points in the second half to put away the Michigan Wolverines. Thanks for listening. This is Willow Tool. Hope you enjoy the games tomorrow. Uh, see you next week with another Park Ridge History Sports Hour. Thanks now.